So I guess it's time for me to start. We do have a hymn we're going to be singing in the middle of it all. I realize the worst, you know, when you look at your college schedule, I don't, we're going to get there. We're going to, we got a kendo making a close-up very soon of my suit, but we're going to get there. So when you teach college, you know, you don't schedule your own classes. They schedule them for you. Actually, at Perkins School of Theology, they give you wherever you want. It's really very nice. But in normal college, you know, you don't. So the two o'clock hour, the worst hour of the day, of course, because everybody's tired from lunch. They're all yawning, this kind of thing. But I, I take pride, very few of them ever fall asleep in class. I'm going to make sure you stay awake. We even have another exercise for you. That's the first thing. The second thing is, there are free books over there. Now, you can, yeah, there's my, oh, my darling. What do they, what do they say? She's wearing a, well, you can't say that. You can't say, oh my gosh, what color is this? What is this? That's Alabama? Oh, we didn't think about that when I put this shirt on this morning, yeah. And I did think of calling, uh, you know, I said I did a tale of two mountains, and then I sat next to Alabama fans yesterday at night at the snacks at the embassy suites, right? And it was like, oh my gosh, it should have been a tale of two teams. Oh my gosh, I had no idea. So what I want to say is uh, Priscilla is over there with free books. So you can either leave today at five o'clock, you're gonna leave with either, with two books or an eye, st an eye patch that's gonna stand for idiot because you passed the opportunity to get two free books. So if you wanna miss the opportunity for two free, we, we don't make any more or less money or anything on these things, but you have the opportunity to get two free books, maybe even signed by the brilliant authors, go home, okay. Third thing is, Kendo, I want a close-up on this suit. You see the suit? Oh, you get to the speckles. Can you get to the speckles? Can you see that? You can't quite see the speckles. Can you get any closer? Not my butt, but the top. That, that is my Edinburgh suit. That is the suit I bought. I had one suit when we, when, when, um, we started at Duke. When Priscilla started at Duke, I needed a suit in 1994, I bought one. When I interviewed at SMU in 2015, I needed a suit, so I bought one. And then Jeremy got married, our son got married, I needed a suit, and I, oh man, the story could go on for 20 minutes about how I bought this suit. But I bought this suit, so this morning I was in sweatshirt because we had the time difference on whether it was 9 o'clock or 8.30. So I came in my sweats, and I hear this voice, we want to see the green suit from Carrie Carter. And so I, it was in the suitcase because I wasn't going to wear it, but there it is. This is one of the, this is a burial suit, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> if I go, I want to go snazzy with my Edinburgh men's store suit. And it was like a dollar to a pound. So it was like a cheap suit. See, it's almost polyester. See, it feels nice. Yeah, okay. Almost plastic. No, it's a really nice suit. Okay, so today we are going to talk we started yesterday Testimony Why, we moved on to Testimony How this morning, and now we're going to move on to two different kinds of testimony today, and we've used the rubric Testimony Where. In the first half, we're actually going to get you working. In the second half, we're going to get you thinking about how you can work when you leave here on these two kinds of testimony. So I've called this from the train station to the trough. So the first kind of testimony we're going to, Priscilla, did I need to make, Priscilla, did I need to make any more announcements or anything? Oh, get on with it. Okay. So the first one is a train station testimony. Everybody, I'm very proud of my little graphics here. Uh, PowerPoint's getting better and better and better. So, um, the first is we all need a train station testimony or we'll call it an airport testimony or talk, call it a coffee shop testimony or call it I'm in the line at Trader Joe's testimony, okay? We all need a very short way to express to people the power of God's story. So we are going to enter, I'm going to have you roll up your sleeves and yes, gird up your loins. 
Gird up your loins and we're gonna do a little exercise, okay? So, here's what we've got. Priscilla this morning gave you something which I thought was, I, I've never seen her do that, and it was really cool to do the seven word testimony this morning. Really to focus down on what matters in the way you tell God's story in your life. But then we used Priscilla's book. I, back at SMU, uh, a few years back, I was a, sort of the faculty convener, the faculty coach for a thing called Faith and Learning. It's an extracurricular thing where you take about a dozen students, they meet 10 times per semester, and they read a little bit, and for an hour and a half you talk about faith and its relationship to learning in some way in their life. And one of the books we read was Priscilla's book. And when the, chat, the first chapter on personal evangelism, I started talking with the students and they really don't share their faith. They don't know how to tell the story of God in their life. And these are very bright, committed Christian students at SMU, undergraduates. And so I started an exercise, which I thought would be kind of fun. I had them get out their phone and put the timer on for one minute and tell someone else the story of God in their life. A train station testimony. So let's say you're in a train station, you've gotten your cup of coffee, or you're the airport or whatever, you get the point. Um, and you've gotten your cup of, cup of coffee and someone's seeing you're reading a book called Seven Secrets of the Spirit-Filled Life. And they say, oh, that's interesting. And you, you strike up a little conversation and then you say, it's a crappy book. But they say, yeah, but what's it about? And so you say, it's about the Holy Spirit. And then the train is gonna come in a minute or they're gonna get on a Southwest Airlines flight. And if you know a Southwest Airlines flight, you gotta elbow your way into the line to be able to board. And so they're gonna to wanna to leave. So you only have one minute. You have one minute to tell them why you're a Christian, or why you believe in God, why is this important to you, that's a train station testimony, a one minute testimony. So are you ready to gird up your loins and practice this? We are, aren't we? Yes. We are, thank you, Rick, and everybody else. <laughs> All the 17 other people who said something, bless you for that. So what I want you to do is find a partner. If you're at a row that has an odd number, you may have to get up and go to another row. Bring your phone with you. As Priscilla said, we know you have them. Bring your phone with you, get your phone out. And what you're going to do is you are gonna put it on for one minute. You are going to turn to your neighbor and you are going to tell your neighbor or listen to your neighbor tell you what's important in God's story in this life for one minute. And at one minute, you are going to stop and then you're gonna do it the other way. So please split up into pairs with your phone set on a timer for one minute. And I'll tell you when to start so we start and stop at the same time. Get your phones to one minute. Okay, you ready? I'm gonna count down three, two, one. And one of you is going to tell the other person the story of God in your life. However you want to do it, you will have one minute, okay? Three, two, one, start.
But the more I learned about him, the more I wanted to know about him, and the more I knew about him, the more I found out that he is real and he's true to his word. And his word has never come back for him. Because of that, God is good. And I can say that because of God, Okay, right? That's about a minute. You know, all your alarms? Let's hear all these lovely alarms go off. Okay, now turn around, put the alarm on for one minute, and do it in the opposite direction. Have the next person tell you the story of God in your life. Remember, you are never going to see each other again. You're on the train station platform or in the airport. Okay? So, you ready? Three, two, one, the other person start talking. Okay, the alarm should start going off. Whatever it is. Now, take one minute to talk to each other about how you think you did. How to work. Did you finish? Were you clear? Were you foggy? Talk to each other. Laura, is she about ready in a minute? We're going to do the Mentimeter now. Oh, okay. Okay, so now, here's what I want you to do. We are going to use the Mentimeter again. We're going to use the Mentimeter again. Somehow, some way, it's going to appear. And you're going to grade yourself. How did you do in terms of clarity? How did you do in terms of timing? How do you feel you did in telling the story of God in your life? Grade yourself A, B, C, and F. You'll notice that I left out D because if you're, any of you are teachers, you know that D is just a sympathy F. So um, it's really all it is. Oh, I can't give that person an F. I'll give them a D. So um, grade yourself A, B, C, or F. How'd you do? Clarity, content, timing. Sorry we can't do this on paper for those who don't know how to use their phone for this, and this stuff is almost beyond me, but... <laughs> okay, are we about done? A few more adding. 
So we have 15 people who are self-deceived. Um, 73 who think more highly of themselves than they ought. No. <laughs> so we have about 16A, about 80B. Oh, keep going. This is great. 80B. What? Yeah, I, I, you know, I've never known how to do a bell curve. Hey, but would someone do me a favor and take a picture of this uh, right now? Thanks. Just someone. Rick, you got, you can, or, or, or so, oh, Rick's gone. Oh, there, there, there he is. Yeah. So take a picture so we know what we've got. 80, uh, 16A, 83B, 36C, and 7 who need really good therapy. <laughs> So, there we are. We're going to do it all again. Uh, okay, we're going to do exactly the same thing again because learning to do a testimony is an art form. It's a skill. It's something we have to cultivate. I mean, I put you on the spot and I said, talk to someone, you have one minute. But you, if we are on the lookout to, to share Christ every day, then we will have these opportunities and we need to be prepared for them. It's like 1 Peter 3.15, right? Always be ready to have an answer for anyone who asks you and do it with gentleness and humility. We should always have a testimony in our back pocket. So we're going to do it exactly the same thing again. You're going to do it one to the other in a minute. So get your phones out and I'm going to count down Three, two, one, and you are going to do the same thing again, correcting what you think you didn't get right the first time. And you're going to do it a little bit better, you hope. You ready? Train station testimony. Three, two, one, start. One minute. You don't have two? You don't have two? Okay, it's been a minute. Set your timer for a minute. And the other person, tell the story with more clarity, better content, and the ability to finish in a minute. Okay, you ready? Three, two, one, go. In a minute. Now talk to each other for a minute. Do you feel you did a better job, a worse job? And maybe the other person can give you a little feedback. One minute.
Okay, now we're going to do the Mentimeter again. And I would like you to grade yourself. Now, notice I've been gentle on you. I could have had the person you talked to grade you, and it may have looked very different. But grade yourself on the Mentimeter, A, B, C, or F. Okay, who took a picture? So, in the first one, how many A's were there? 16 A's the first time around, and notice how many A's in the second. <laughs> Thank, it's the suit. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, can we have this again? Can we have the graph? Laura, can we get the pie, pie chart? There, yeah, good, oh, okay. So, we have 54 A's. How did B's do? They went down a little, right? What about the C's? What were, the, what were they the first time? So the C's have gone down, and what about the F's? They've cut down just about in half. So the C's went down, the F's went down, the A's went up. What does that tell you about practicing the art of telling God's story? What happens when you practice? You get, it's easier, you get better at it, more adept at telling God's story. We did that in 15 minutes. Imagine if everyone in this room practiced it. And imagine if you got together in small groups in your congregations and practiced it with each other. It would be funny and fun and you could laugh at the grading and you would have thousands, thousands, ten thousands of people if you work in small groups, tens of thousands of people able to talk about God's story in their lives. Imagine the power of the words of people with beautiful feet, perfectly suited to bringing good news, one beggar at a time, to their world if we practice this. And imagine all the things you do that take a minute or so that you can use those opportunities. A brand new slide. I don't think Priscilla would have put the one in the middle. I could have used real people. Just want you to know, it's not hard to find real people sitting on the toilet. But I didn't do that. So think of all the things you do in a given day. You put on your earrings 30 to 45 seconds. 
testimony time. Practice it. You get dressed. A minute. Testimony time. Practice it. You go to the refrigerator, and if you're like me, you forget what you went for. Practice testimony as you stand in front of the fridge, as you shave, as you walk a dog, as you clean the poop out of the kitty litter, whatever it is, find a time and a place. It's one minute a day. Did you see the improvement? in your second time as opposed to your first? Imagine if in the course of your life you do this a hundred times and someone asks you, why are you a Christian? Oh, I've been watching the news. How do you still believe in God? What's that book you're reading? Why do you wear that dog collar? Anything like this and you've been practicing as you've shaved or put on your earrings or walked your god dog or taken a you-know-what. Imagine if every day you practiced on the toilet the art of testimony, of telling God's story. It wouldn't be just your feet that are beautiful. I don't know what that joke really meant, but obviously a little resonation. Not in my notes, not in my notes. So I want you to commit. I want you to commit when you go home to finding one task you do a day and saying, I'm going to redeem this minute. Remember Paul used the phrase, redeem the time for evil are the days thereof. Well, there's no doubt that when you're sitting on the toilet, evil are the days thereof. So redeem the time and tell God's story. Practice it. Because if you're looking for people, if you're open to the Spirit, we'll talk about this tomorrow morning, and I really hope you'll be there, being open to the Spirit, leading us to people so that we can take time to tell God's story then you need to practice this and then do it in a group. Go out with a friend with coffee and have some fun and say, you know, we did this thing at annual conference. You're not going to believe it. It was kind of stupid, but hey, it worked. I started with a C and I ended up with a B. I started with a B and I ended up with an A. I started with an F. I skipped right over the D's and went to a C. Okay? You get the idea. Let's begin to practice and practice and practice telling this beautiful story that make our feet beautiful, perfectly suited to telling other people, one beggar at a time, the good news of Jesus Christ crucified and risen in our lives and in this world. That's the first part of today. The 10 minute, the, the train station testimony. Okay? We can do this. Remember, we talked about stepping out of the cave. And I know for many of us, it's sort of like, I'm not real comfortable talking about Jesus. So take a few steps out of the cave. Keep your hand on the cave entry, you know, like there. You know, hold on to your mantle. Fuck her tongue. Hold on and say, I'm going to do this. Because you know what? What we're finding is people are very happy to be in conversation about faith or unfaith or any faith they may have. And I do wonder if sometimes they're more eager to talk once the, once the barriers are removed than we, they're more, easy, they're more willing to talk than we are. Okay, but we're gonna shift gears and I, I hope this is okay, it doesn't give you sort of mental, uh, uh, whiplash, and the one good thing is, is anybody, raise your hand if you're asleep. <laughs> oh, yes. <that's so> <laughs> Put your hand down. So, yeah. Okay, you ready? We're, now we're going to talk about something else. We're going to talk about testimony in a trough. And this is just as important as the seven-word testimony we did this morning, as the train station testimony we just did. Now we're going to talk about testimony from a trough. So I grew up on Long Island in Hicksville, New York, which was actually a baby boom. The first Levitt houses were built there after World War II. And that's where I grew up. And I went to the Hicksville Church of Christ. I cleaned the outside for $2.50 a week, and I cleaned the inside for $2.50 a week. And it was stuck between what, what at the time was a TV repair store and something else. It was just tucked inauspiciously back there, and that's where I cut my teeth on faith. And it was 
a kind of church that liked to talk about all that God had done, how God had brought us out of something into something else. This is exemplified by the hymn, this is from the Cokesbury hymnal, Love Lifted Me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. And I thought with the great music we have here that we could sing the song of the testimony of how love lifted me out. So do you want to stand up if you can? And we should sing or sit. Oh, we want to stand. We got hands already kicking. We're going to sing this hymn. And do the part, you know, even me. Do that part. And I'm not going to sing too much because I got the mic. I was thinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me. are the kind of songs I was raised on. Songs of victory, songs of life-giving, songs of conversion, hymns of salvation, and they were wonderful. And we were a small congregation, and we had the little kind of organ that was in the wall. It was and it was always played three times too slowly, three times as slowly as that. And we crooned the end, you know, love lifted. And every, like we sang, How Great Thou Art. So this is the way we sang it. Oh, Lord, my God. Because no one really knew how to play the piano or the organ very well, so we just had to follow the organist. But we learned on those beautiful hymns of salvation and rescue. But that's not the whole of the Christian life. And many people who ask us that question, why do you believe in God? Why are you a Christian? Are doing it out of a vulnerable place, out of a place of pain, out of a place of darkness, and to offer them a testimony of everything worked out for me is really not what they need. They need 
a testimony from the trough. They need a testimony that brings us alongside them. They need to hear a story about God that's a story about God in the darkness and in the depression. So what can we do about testimonies of times when God does not rescue us? Well, I think the best place to start with this is a wonderful chapter, chapter eight in C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters. In C.S. Lewis, this is a senior devil writing to a junior devil about how to keep a young man who's become a Christian from faith. And it's a very powerful chapter. I want to read this together with you because it talks about Christians in the peaks and Christians in the troughs. Because we're gonna develop a testimony from the trough in the time we have together now. Lewis writes, humans are amphibians, half spirit and half animal. This means that while their spirit can be directed to an eternal object, their bodies, passions, and imaginations are in continual change. For to be in time means to change. Their nearest approach to constancy, therefore, is undulation. The repeated level, repeated return to a level from which they repeatedly fall back. A series of troughs and peaks. The senior devil then goes on to say that God uses the troughs even more than the peaks to nurture faith. God doesn't magically rescue us or lift us from the troughs. God uses the troughs to allow us to exercise obedient faith. So the senior devil writes that God is prepared to do a little overriding at the beginning. He will set them off with communications of his presence which, though faint, seem great to them with emotional sweetness and easy conquest over temptation. But he never allows this state of affairs to, add, to last long. Sooner or later, God withdraws if not in fact, at least from their conscious experience, all those supports and incentives. God leaves the creature to stand up on its own legs, to carry out from the will alone duties which have lost all relish. It is during such trough periods, Lewis writes, the, the senior devil says, much more than during the peak periods, that it is growing into the sort of creature God wants it to be. Hence, the prayers offered in the state of dryness are those which please God best. God wants them to learn to walk and must therefore take away his hand. And if only the will to walk is really there, he is pleased even with their stumbles. Do not be deceived, Wernwood, says the senior devil. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks round upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished and asks why he has been forsaken and still obeys. This is where we need to develop a testimony from, from the trough, from the apparent absence of God in our world, in our life. One of the best books I ever read in graduate school was a book by Samuel Terrian. It was a biblical theology called The Elusive Presence, The Apparent Absence of God Throughout the Bible. Not the times when God is there, the times when God seems not to be there. And in order to help our, our really hurting and dark world, we need to come alongside them with versions of the story of God that can accompany them where they are rather than promising them something that they don't have. So I have a way to help you to do that. It's very practical, and I hope to goodness you will do exactly this when you go home. There's a lot of poetry in the Bible that comes from the trough. 
Not the peaks, but the troughs. The book of Psalms, of course, contains many testimonies from the trough, right? So, those of you who did maybe go to seminary may have word, I doubt it. How many of you have heard of Hermann Gunkel? Okay, some of you have heard of Hermann Gunkel. You obviously went to Perkins School of Theology rather than to an inferior seminary. <laughs> Hermann Gunkel was an Old Testament scholar in the early 1900s who talked about the different genres of literature in terms of form criticism. And he kind of organized the Psalms into different types of Psalms. And he noticed that there were a lot of individual prayers which we would say are from the trough. He called them psalms of individual lament. He noticed there were a lot of psalms that came from the trough, not of individuals, but of communities. He called those community laments. There are lots of these in the Bible that express God's, God's poetry in the context of God's apparent absence. So a beautiful example of this is Psalm 42, which I'm taking from the message here. A white-tailed deer drinks from the creek. I want to drink God, deep, deep drafts of God. I'm thirsty for God alive. I wonder, will I ever make it? Arrive and drink in God's presence? I'm on a diet of tears, tears for breakfast, tears for supper. All day long, people knock at my door, pestering, where is this God of yours? If we want to develop testimony of the trust, we do that in conversation with psalms like that. And here's what I'm going to recommend, and I really like this. You're the first people to see this. You take a piece of paper, and you turn it sideways, and you draw a line in the middle, and on the right-hand side, you copy by hand, if you'd like, the psalm that expresses God's absence in the world, the pain, the agony that the psalmist feels. And then on the right side, you write your own poem that expresses the agony of God's absence or felt absence. And you allow the Bible to become a point of resonance between your experience of God's absence, of human darkness, of depression, of weariness, and of fatigue. And you put them next to each other and you allow the scripture become, to become a dialogue partner with you, a friend alongside you to develop a poem from the trough. Another example which I just threw in about, well, 40 minutes ago now, I noticed that this morning someone mentioned Psalm 102. And I thought this is a beautiful psalm that expresses life in the trough. God, listen. Listen to my prayer. Listen to the pain in my cries. Don't turn your back on me just when I need you so desperately. Pay attention. This is a cry for help and hurry. This can't wait. I'm wasting away to nothing. I'm burning up with fever. I'm a ghost of my former self, half consumed already by terminal illness. My jaws ache from gritting my teeth. I'm nothing but skin and bones. I'm like a buzzard in the desert, a crow perched on the rubble, insomniac. I twitter away, mournful as a sparrow in the gutter. All day long, my enemies taunt me while others just curse. They bring in meals, casseroles of ashes. I draw a drink from a barrel of my tears. And all because of your furious anger, you swept me up and threw me out. There's nothing left of me, a withered weed swept clean from the path. We don't develop testimonies of the trough in a vacuum. We develop testimonies of the trough in the context of the trough-like poetry of Scripture. So plan when you go back to turn that paper sideways, draw a line down the middle, pick a psalm of individual or community, community lament, and interact with this psalm by writing your own and developing that poetry from the trough or the prophets give us a ton of examples of working from the trough because they were always rejected. Nobody in their day believed what they had to say. Their stuff was preserved only because it actually was true and valued by later generations. So a great example of this is Jeremiah 15. You know where I am, God. Remember what I'm doing here. Take my side against my detractors. 
You got that. We all got detractors. And not the kind, sorry, not the kind that are on the farm. We all got detractors. Don't stand, I'm sorry, I don't, it's not in my notes. Well, it's, it's after lunch. Don't stand back while they ruin me. Just look at the abuse I'm taking. When your words showed up, I ate them, swallowed them whole. What a feast. What delight I took in being yours, O oh God, God of the angel armies. I never joined the party crowd in their laughter and their fun. Led by you, I went off by myself. You'd filled me with indignation. Their sin had me seething, but why? Why this chronic pain? This ever worsening wound and no healing in sight. You're nothing, God, but mirage. A lovely oasis in the distance and then nothing. Develop a complaint, a complaint from the trough in conversation with Jeremiah. He'll never stand in judgment of your anger. Develop that as you move along and think about telling other people God's story from a trough. Or there are stories from the trough, right? All throughout the Bible. Oh my goodness gracious, there are so many. There's the story of Joseph in prison, innocently in prison. There are more stories of Jeremiah in prison. Jeremiah, remember, thrown into a cistern with mud up to his knees. That qualifies for a trough. <laughs> and it's those stories that allow us to tell our story, not of rescue, not how love lifted me, but how we experience being people of faith deep in the trough with our knees, with, our, uh, with mud up to our knees. This is a simple practice. And it makes scripture your dialogue partner because scripture is nothing if unvarnished and willing to say what pure anger at God looks like. Cultivating our testimony from the trough. The poetry of the Old Testament, the prophecies of the Old Testament, the stories of the Old Testament are your best friend to give words to testimony from the trough. And then of course, what about the Gospels, right? The Gospels, many scholars have said, are basically just prelude to the passion narratives. That much of the Gospels is about Jesus' road to his death. In Matthew, the triumphal entry happens in chapter 21. So, what percentage of Matthew is about the road to his death? A quarter of Matthew is about the road to his death. There's a lot there that can help you to develop a story from the trough. What about Mark? About how much of Mark is from the triumphal entry to the death of Jesus? A third of Mark is about Jesus going toward his death. There's a lot of trough story there for you. Luke, what percentage of Luke is about Jesus moving from triumphal entry to ignominious death. Yeah, almost a quarter, 20 to 25 percent of Luke. And as you reflect on that, maybe take Lent to reflect on these, turning your paper sideways, having the story on the right, and your story of God on the left, developing your story in in connection with Jesus' story. And then what about uh, John's gospel? How much of John's gospel goes from the, the night, basically the last 48 hours of his life? Half. Half of John's gospel is the last 48 hours of Jesus' life. We can use the gospels to develop stories from the trough that can resonate with people in anguish, people who are, feel like they are marching to their own death and depression and darkness. We have something to offer from the trough. And then the book of Acts. The first 21 chapters of Acts are relatively hunky-dory. 
The church is growing. Everything is moving. They're on mission trips. They're traveling here and there. The Holy Spirit is moving, bringing solutions to problems, right? All these things are going on. And then in chapter 21, it comes to a screeching halt. A screeching halt as Paul is thrown into prison and spends the rest of Acts basically waiting to figure out what's going to happen. I want you to see something. We can't do much with it. But I want you to notice something here. The story of Paul's so-called conversion or calling takes place in Acts chapter 9. When he's in prison in chapter 21... Notice what happens to that story, his testimony, his personal testimony of what happened. Notice what happens to it. As he sits in prison, it grows as he has time to think about it. And then he languishes further and further and further in prison, doesn't he? And in chapter 26, he tells the story again and look what has happened to it. Right? It's gone from this to this to this. And you know what makes up most of the expansion in chapter 26? The language of the book of Isaiah. Because Paul has clearly been meditating on Scripture. And as his testimony grows, as his story grows, it grows in conversation with the book of Isaiah. He is a man of the book, and he's a man of deep personal experience, and he brings them together, and each time he tells his story, it gets more biblical and more expansive and more powerful, and you have the opportunity to do that. Same book of Isaiah, same languishing at times in your life, the same apparent absence of God plaguing us, nibbling at our heels. And you, like Paul, have the opportunity to develop your personal testimony from the trough and in the trough and watch it grow in conversation with Scripture. We need, we need a testimony from the trough if Priscilla's right, and a lot of people say, well, I don't want to do this because the Baptists do this, ours can be real life, authentic, vulnerable, honest, unvarnished, even angry. As we develop these testimonies from the trough in conversation with Scripture. It's poetry its oracles, its stories. And this is a spiritual discipline that will make us of such use to our broken world. You want beautiful feet? You want feet perfectly suited to helping this broken world? Sometimes they need people to come alongside them and talk about faith in the trough. We have given you today what we hope are three really good practices for telling God's story in meaningful and powerful ways. You saw how beautiful those seven word testimonies were today. How memorable some of them were. How they evoke questions, right? You saw how well that worked. Practice them and practice them with others. And you saw how you improved in your train station testimony just by repeating it once. Practice it. Practice it individually. Practice when you walk your dog. Practice when you take a crap. I don't care when you practice, just practice. And then bring those beautiful feet to your world. And then practice in conversation with Scripture the wonderful opportunity we have to develop our story 
in a trough in conversation with the wonderful authors of Scripture. These are three things we want you. We are desperate, right, Priscilla? We are desperate for you to take home, to practice as individuals, to practice as groups, to practice as congregations. The seven-word testimony, the train station testimony, and the testimony from a trough. How beautiful, how perfectly suited are the feet of those who bring good news. Bring good news. Amen.